The potential for, for outright conflict is much higher now than it was before. And it, uh, we worry in the Philippines because it could come from not, not a strategic decision by anyone saying, okay, we're going to war, but just by making some, some servicemen making a mistake. And that was a comment from the president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Bongbong Jr., last week to a reporter at ABC News Australia. That comment caused a massive stir in his country and beyond, including the neighbors and possibly the United States. You're watching News Desk, and uh, this is a weekly conversation where we take one a topic, dive deep into it, take your contributions, and hopefully walk away with a better understanding of what's happening. My name is Melissa Chan. Yeah, and I'm Alex Forrest-Whiting, and I'll be paying special attention to what you're putting in the chat, trying to bring your comments to life to our discussion, also putting some of your questions to our great experts who will be joining us a little bit later. And I must say a big thank you to the hundreds of you who had already uh, posted some of your comments uh, on uh, uh, the, uh, on what we had put up earlier. And a quick hello to uh, Canoness Eleanor, who wrote, can we please stop living in interesting times? And I think that kind of sums it all up, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. An underplay, definitely interesting times, crazy times maybe. But yeah, thanks very much for being here and I'll be keeping an eye on everything you've got to say. Yeah, so this week, uh, these comments from Bang Bang left us wondering, uh, Everyone talks about a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, the global concern seems to be uh, uh, around the Taiwan Straits. But what if the hot war actually happened elsewhere in Asia, in Southeast Asia? So this week's big question is China and the Philippines, Asia's next hot war. And joining us uh, around this table for DW. We have got, to my right, we have Michelle Stockman, and she is our reporter. She will Everybody. be helping us keep up to date with the latest of what's been going on and why we're discussing it this week. Across from me on the table, we have Jared Reed. Hi, he, everyone. Hi. Uh, he's also <laughs> going to be in the chat along with me, keeping helping me, actually, a little bit, and also um, commenting um, for some of your questions, putting in important links. Um, so thanks very much for doing that. We couldn't do this without you. No and the man we really couldn't do this without is Dustin. Hemmerlein, he is in our control room. You can't see him. We can hear him when he speaks to us. He's very important to all this because he's our producer. So that is us. Yeah, and in a few minutes, beaming in from Asia, we'll have two experts, incredible people who'll be able to answer your questions, our questions about what is going on uh, on the high seas in Southeast Asia. We have Colin Ko, Senior Fellow at the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies at the S. Raja, uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. And we also have Richard Haydarian, a, an author, a columnist, and a political scientist, usually out of Manila. He's joining us from Osaka, and he's also an Indo-Pacific expert. Yeah, and um, I must just pick up on a quick comment that has come in from Adrian Garay. Why are two women talking instead of men like it should be? I know you're joking. <laughs> lie, lie. We're all laughing, we're all laughing. Um, anyway, we do want your questions and your comments. Hopefully um, you will be, uh, you know, behind the women who are t leading this discussion. Um, but particularly if you have got some comments for our two special guests, Richard and Colin. And to kick things off, we've actually got a poll question um, that we have put out, and we'd love it if you could vote. And you can see it, obviously, on your screen, but I'll just read it anyway. What is more likely, a Chinese conflict with the Philippines or a Chinese conflict with Taiwan? A is with the Philippines, B is with Taiwan, C, there will be no conflict. So do please vote on that because it would be great uh, to see what you say. And thank you, Adrian. He's put LOL. So, yeah, we're all <laughs> laughing here. <laughs> yeah, I'll be very curious about the, the poll numbers. Um, but, uh, look, before we get to our guests from Asia, Michelle, yeah. I know you've been working on this and preparing a 101, sort of the basics yeah. for anyone who doesn't really understand what's going on. Right, okay, well, let a woman take it away here. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to those comments from President Marcos. They came just after what is a long series of maritime incidents on the South China Sea between China and the Philippines who have competing sovereignty claims on the South China Sea. And so I'm going to bring up a map here on my laptop to show all of you out there. 
the context behind this conflict and why these run-ins keep on happening. So here is the South China Sea. That's what the UN calls it. Of course, other countries with coasts along this waterway have decided to name portions of it different names, such as the Philippines calls a portion of it the West Philippine Sea. But for today's discussion, we're going to go with the UN with the UN name. But this is a very important body of water. Uh, it's got vital trade routes, fish, oil and gas deposits, strategic military outposts. And so the latest encounter that we're talking about between the Philippines and China happened right around here, which is called the Second Thomas Shoal. So there was a Philippines resupply ship that was headed out to Marines who were stationed on a scuttled World War II era ship, basically guarding the Philippines' claim to this atoll. And uh, Chinese Coast Guard ships came and sprayed high-pressure water cannons trying to make it veer off course. And there were several crew members on board who were injured. Now, this atoll is one of at least two that both the Philippines and China claim. Uh, the other one is up here, the Scarborough Shoal, which actually China seized control of in 2012. There are other islands within the South China Sea that are disputed. We've got the Paracel Islands up here that is claimed by uh, Taiwan, China, and Vietnam, and then also the Spratly Islands right here. All these countries that you see in orange have claims uh, among the Spratly Islands. Okay, but let's go back again to the two, um, the second Thomas Shoal and the Scarborough Shoal. These both lie within areas that are claimed both by the Philippines within its exclusive economic zone here and also within uh, China's nine dash line claim. This is the red lines that you see here. These were drawn on a map and released by China in 1947. They've changed a little bit since then, but basically at that time, China claimed about 90% of the South China Sea. And That's they said, kind okay, of extreme extension, just uh, eyeballing it, yeah. just looking at the map. Yeah, it's like a third of China's mainland land area. It's extending the country by like a third, okay? China says this is backed up by history for centuries. Uh, the, par the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands were considered part of mainland China. Mm. But these other countries in orange, again here, said, well, China, we can say the same thing. Mm. We can say that history backs up our claims to these islands. And so they've disputed these claims. Uh, in fact, the Philippines brought a case against China uh, in the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague and basically disputing the Nine-Dash Line claim, among other things. In 2016, the court ruled China's nine dash line claims have no legal basis. China, of course, has ignored these claims ever since, blatantly ignoring them. And for basically the past 20 years has been on a campaign of military buildup throughout the South China Sea, and also a campaign of intimidation against other countries who are trying to maintain control of their claims, such as this encounter that just happened with the Philippines. So that, that bring, that's, uh, I think, a time now to bring in Dustin. Dustin, I hope you can hear me. Um, you have prepared, I know, Dustin, some video of this encounter that we've been talking about, and we can bring it up here. What you're about to see here. Okay, so we've kind of got, you, you see these high-pressure water cannons that are being sprayed at this resupply ship. Wow. It's, yeah, it's really tiny. And then there's going to be, uh, I mean, can you imagine just the high pressure water that's coming at this little tiny ship? And then Whoa. boom. Wow. Boom, it breaks the glass. Oh my God. So oh. it's pretty. Do you okay. Think that, do you think that was intentional? I mean, that was quite some force. A absolutely. And they're really close to each other. Oh, and it's being surrounded. There's yeah. two boats. I mean, if we talk, this has been described by President Marcos, by Bongo Marcos, as a mm. David and Goliath battle. Here. Okay, let me take back battle. It's a, it's a David and Goliath moment. Let's say that. However, we can see that the David in this case does not have nearly kind of the the kind of weapon. I don't want to call it a weapon again. Sorry. Right. The, the kind of strength or power intimidation tactics that the other boats do. I mean, I can also see looking at this video that they could easily end up ramming each other and causing a lot of dangerous, a dangerous situation where a boat starts sinking, people start drowning. I, I mean, that has happened. They have rammed uh, these uh, resupply boats. They've also used mm -hmm. other tactics like shining high-powered lasers. Uh, and so it's really, um, these run-ins just keep on happening because if we see this, um, this is, this is the resupply boat, but it's headed towards the Sierra Madre, mm. which is this uh, scuttled World War II era ship. 
the Chinese vessels are just waiting for that to fall apart. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and so it's just intimidation tactics until that time. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, full on stuff, isn't it? You, that's quite, quite some video. Um, just want to say hello to everyone who's joining us in the chat. Thank you very much. There seem to be quite a few of you um, from the Philippines, so hello. Um, and a couple of um, comments. Um, Worm Boy says, I tell you this, your federal government, and I think by that they mean the US, has a treaty with us to defend the Philippines. Never forget the hundreds of thousands of Filipinos who fought and died because of your war with Japan during World War II and Vietnam. Uh, you have a big responsibility because you've been using us as your shield against many enemies in Asia. And Mr. S and Chess says, keep out and let powers shift. So, um, and there are many, many more Very uh, comments in the chat. Yeah, but yeah I mean, a taste. I think later we should ask about that treaty and find out a little bit more. Um, but uh, now is a good time to... Um Oh yes, to bring in to bring in our guests. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we we have Richard Haydarian to, uh, sort of beaming in from Osaka, and and if you have any questions for Richard uh, specifically about uh, the perspective from the Philippines, definitely post that in uh, the chat, and uh, all of us are looking at what's online, and, and we're going to try to bring in as many questions as possible. Um, for those catching up, just tuning in, the question we're asking today is China and the Philippines, Asia's next hot war. And um, hopefully we get closer to uh, a better understanding of tensions in the South China Sea after uh, this conversation. So I'm going to first, uh, Richard, stand by. We're going to replay that soundbite from the president of the Philippines and his comments in regards to China. The potential for, for outright conflict is much higher now than it was before. And it, uh, we worry in the Philippines because it could come from not, not a strategic decision by anyone saying, OK, we're going to war, but just by making some, some servicemen making a mistake. So those were the comments uh, from the president of the Philippines last week to ABC News Australia and caused a, a brouhaha. Uh, Richard Haydarian is joining us now from Osaka. Thank you so much. First of all, we know it's pretty late there. And um, Richard is, a, I would describe it, a national security rock star. He is an author, <laughs> columnist, uh, political scientist. I know he was a Munich Security Council a young leader. Uh, Richard, how are you, first of all? Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure. Always good to join you guys. I want to ask, uh, can you just react, respond to what the president said? Um, how was it received in the Philippines? Uh, and was he addressing a domestic audience? Was he addressing China? I mean, why did mm -hmm. he say what he said? Yeah, I think uh, as far as President Marcos Jr. is concerned, he was definitely trying to engage the international media. And, and my sense is he tends to be much more engaging when he's dealing with actually Western or international media, especially in the United States or Europe or in this case in Australia. Actually, the, the news back in the Philippines did not concern his comments on the South China Sea or China, but some of the uh, questions regarding his family's background. I mean, after all, we're talking about Ferdinand Marcus Jr., right? Um, they're quite a notorious dynasty, to put it mildly, right? But... This is the thing. If you look at the things that uh, Marcus Jr. is saying about the South China Sea, um, there's nothing new there. I mean, these are the things that we were warning about throughout the years. These are the things that the late and former president Benigno uh, Aquino Jr. was warning about in early 2010s. He's the president behind our unprecedented decision and in many ways historic decision to take China to international court. But the reason why Marcus Jr. suddenly sounds like a breath of fresh air, ironically, for, for that matter, is because we had six years of Rodrigo Duterte, a president who was, to put it mildly, really from an alternative universe, who, when it comes to anything regarding the South China Sea issue, if you listen to the interviews that the former president gave on the South China Sea issues, he was always trying to essentially lawyer or apologize for China. So now I think President Marco Jr. is saying the correct things, something that the uh -oh. Jinping is not excited about starting a war. We know that President Xi Jinping uh, is focused on the economic troubles at home. 
But at the rate things are going, if China continues to send an armada of militia forces, on professional forces, of you know, uh, you know, uh, trigger happy maritime force. accidental clashes escalate into something much bigger. Uh, Richard, uh, thanks so much for that. You were breaking up a little bit there, so I don't quite think I got the, the back half of that. But um, but uh, point taken about uh, the, the difference between the Duterte administration and the Marcos Jr. administration, can we just follow up on uh, the comment from uh, one of the people online uh, regarding this treaty? What does the treaty actually say? What... Uh, are the U.S. obligations and um, and what is the sense and confidence that the from the Philippines that the Americans will stick to whatever they have promised? Yeah, I'm actually well. Current in the United States, uh, that treaty is pretty clear uh, about America's obligations to come to Japan's rescue if ever it's invaded. Uh, by a third party, for that matter, let's say China. Um, but in the case of the Philippines and the United States, there's a certain inbuilt ambiguity uh, into the mutual defense treaty. In fact, for instance, there has to be some sort of a buy-in or some sort of a, uh, implied veto by other branches of the U.S. government, let's say the U.S. Congress, for instance. So there is a degree of ambiguity, and that degree of ambiguity actually was very much central to America's approach to the uh, South China Sea issue during the Nixon administration all the way to the Obama administration. But towards the end of the, well, for maybe first Trump administration, and now under the Biden administration, we see a political decision to diminish that. Nineteen, we have uh, multiple American administrations saying that if the Philippines uh, troops, vessels, or aircrafts were to be at ah, I think Richard's frozen up. Uh, I was hoping that it come through, and after all, he is in Osaka, where. Uh one would think the internet is pretty fast and furious. <laughs> um, <laughs> compared to Berlin. <laughs> but, but I think we got our answer in terms of uh, just the mutual defense treaty that the United States has with the Philippines. Um, you know, it looks like the Americans, if they really didn't want to uh, engage uh, with China uh, on this matter in the South China Seas, they have an out. Uh, through Congress and through other mechanisms. And, and because we're trying to reconnect with Richard, I think this is a good time to try to bring in Colin. Uh, Dustin, can you confirm uh, that Colin is also on standby and ready to join us? Okay, let's bring in Colin. I know he's been listening to part of the conversation. Colin Co, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and again, it is also very late in Singapore. A quick reminder of, um, of uh, Colin uh, and who he is. He is a specialist, also another rock star in the Indo-Pacific uh, and a specialist in naval affairs. And he joins us from uh, the S. Rajaratnam School of International uh, Studies. Thank you so much for um, joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're very kind. I will help as much as I can. Absolutely. So we were just talking to Richard about sort of the, the, the why Marcos Jr. Uh, said what he said. And then, of course, Richard explained a little bit about the Mutual Defense Treaty and uh, the U.S. obligation to that. Um, I'm a little curious. Um, do you, like, why has the Philippines become more wary of China uh, under uh, Marcos Jr.? And why has there been this shift in, in policy uh, since Duterte? Hmm. I think there is very much a uh, sort of a, you know, often circulated assumption that everything all started under the current administration. That's not exactly true. And I agree with what Richard has said earlier about the six years of Duterte's administration that is considered rather abnormal. I'll give you context. Um, during the time when Duterte was president, uh, throughout the six years, public uh, surveys in the Philippines highlighted a few important, uh, I would say, characteristics. I think one is that Duterte himself, um, as a president, was uh, pretty popular amongst the people. Uh, he was uh, sort of, you know, praised and given uh, pretty high public approval ratings on various areas, such as, for example, how he handled the COVID-19, um, how he handled the economy in general, 
how he handled internal security. But there's one area that he consistently didn't do very well has been his approach to China. Uh, and by the extension, uh, it is also with regard to how the public in the Philippines perceive China and the South China Sea issue. So I think that has been pretty consistent. But as what Richard had already pointed out, you know, uh, Duterte had uh, somewhat uh, preferred to lawyer for China throughout his six years. And he had reached some form of agreements with China. Mm. Uh, those are not written agreements, but it appeared to have been verbal agreements that were not uh, institutionalized. And, and But they were nonetheless taken as um, a concrete form of agreement by China. Um, and of course, you know, that seems to have changed. Uh, and I thought the change started around early 2020 uh, mm. during the time when, um, you know, there was uh, the uh, COVID-19. Um, that was a time when China was going around and somehow getting to some pretty serious incidents with the various South China Sea parties in Southeast Asia, like right. the case of uh, Indonesia, the case of Malaysia uh, with West Capella, and then you would think that uh, China would somehow leave the Philippines alone, given that Duterte was somewhat you know, taken as the poster boy of Sino-Philippine uh, relationship uh, after the Aquino administration back then. Mm. But uh, I think he was all proven wrong because in 2021, um, we Sun Reef incident blew up. And I think that was what I believe to be um, the turning point of uh, Duterte's uh, policy towards China, we saw, for example, uh, Duterte rescinded the earlier decision mm. to scrap the visiting forces agreement with the US. And thereafter, um, in the final months, um, what we saw was a more a much harder stance towards China in terms of how the Philippines deploy maritime forces. And so essentially, Marcos Jr. administration built on that. Very interesting. And I yeah, think, yeah, I this do, yeah there's, there's lots of comments, um, uh, particularly about what's, um, you know, the, um, what's going on in the Philippines. And Richard has rejoined us. So, so uh, questions well, for either of them. For either. So this is from Pomni, um, who just states, it is obvious that the Philippines is trying to hedge between the two giants, in other words, between the US and between China. Is that correct? Yeah, Richard, if you, um, since you, you got knocked off, why don't you go, uh, answer that one? Do you think it's a yeah, hedge? Probably I'm being sabotaged. Probably some people didn't <laughs> like my answers a while ago. Uh, it always happens to me. But I was surprised it happens to me in Japan. I thought this is a safe space. Um, well, I mean, Colin is, Colin is right. I mean, uh, actually, even towards the end of the Duterte administration, uh, 2021, he openly called out China and essentially said, hey, you don't do this to your friends. This is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, during the ASEAN-China summit uh, in 2021. Now, uh, going back to your Questions. What was the question again? Sorry. So it's from <laughs> somebody called. It's from um, a user called Pomni. He says, "I um, basically is saying that um, the Philippines is hedging its bets between two great giants, yes, yes, the yes. US of and hedging, China." Yeah, yeah. Well, hedging. I, I always say it, it's like fifty shades of hedging, right, across the <laughs> Southeast Asian region. All of us are hedging in one way or another. And in the Philippines, different administrations have been hedging differently. Even Duterte was hedging at some point, but he was tilting far more towards China than the United States. If you look at uh, President Marcos Jr., he has also been hedging. Uh, initially, actually, he also wanted the new era of golden relationship with China. He said that when he met Wang Yi uh, in 2022, just a few months after he won, he called Xi Jinping and said, we are going to shift our relationship to a higher ground. And this is where you can see China is not a very sophisticated rising power. Everyone talks about, especially there in Europe, I always hear Chinese statecraft, sophistication. I don't see that. They had a golden opportunity with Duterte to seal the deal, to come up with at least some white elephant projects. But all they offered us was pledge trap. Forget about debt trap, because in debt trap, there's investment. In the Philippines, there was just empty pledges. Nothing came in. And then they tried to do that to Marcos Jr., Except Marcoses, unlike Duterte, are OG, right? They have been in this geopolitical <laughs> business for decades. I mean, you can find pictures of Marcos Jr. with Mao Zedong mm -hmm. in the 70s. So you're not going to pull off what you pulled off with Duterte with Marcos Jr. So when Marcos Jr. last January went to China, he only had two days, unlike his father, who had like 10 days, I think, when he was there in the 70s. He brought in hundreds of Filipino businessmen, including Chinese Filipino businessmen, and he got really nothing. Uh, China did not offer any compromise on the South China's issue. 
any compromise on the uh, unfulfilled investments. And only a few weeks after that, you see a dramatic change in Marcus Jr. tone, especially in the World Economic Forum. And then the following month, he green-lighted not only expansion of the Philippines military cooperation with the United States, but also with Japan. So there are now conversations with a trilateral security cooperation among Japanese and Filipinos and Americans, also focusing on Taiwan, not only on the South China Sea. So this hedging is not like, you know, there's a software you download and then, you know, this is president's hedging. Well, no, no, the presidents are um, responding to China's own actions and calculus. So Colin's absolutely right. China has been trying to, to have the cake and eat it too, and they have been really abusing their... So the strategic opportunism of China, coupled with their inability to make the most out of their strategic opening in the Philippines, is why we are where we are today. So what really annoys me with China's rhetoric nowadays mm. is twofold. One is dismissing the Philippines as a pawn of the United States, when we're not defending America's territory, we're defending the Philippines' sovereign rights. And number two, completely denying the Philippines' strategic agency, when in fact the Philippines is doing this for its own national interest, right? Not for anyone's uh, national interest. And we're defending our own sovereign rights. So I call this strategic gaslighting. China is gaslighting the Philippines for doing what is right. And they're now gaslighting Marcos Jr. when Marcos Jr. is doing nothing genius. He's just continuing what Aquino was doing seven, eight years ago, except because Duterte came before him, he suddenly looks like the hero of the day. Right. Um, that I, is fascinating. I, 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 more I just, questions, well, I just, right? I just yeah. wanted to say that your nine shades of hedging was, was well liked in the chat. <laughs> Scotch and salmon roll. That's a great name. Scotch and salmon roll um, certainly liked it and others. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of questions generally about um, China and views about, um, you know, what China's going to do with the Philippines, but I don't know if now is the time to mention that or whether um, yeah, I'm going to distract Yeah, let's hold on from, that. We're yeah. going to talk about sort of the 50,000 feet, sort of China, why China thinks the way it does. But before we do that, I think it'll be fun, fun, our idea of fun, <laughs> to talk about the boats on the sea. Like, I, I know that sounds so simple, but we, we often in news talk about a, a skirmish on the South China Sea. What is actually happening on these waters? How many ships are there? Are there just Chinese Coast Guard ships like we saw in the video? Um, what, uh, how, what is the strength of the Philippine Navy? We, of course, know that the Americans talk about freedom of the navigation of the seas there. So, so are they out there? Like many countries, I imagine, must be represented uh, on these waters just I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Um, I just want to say, this is a really busy global trade route. Yeah. I've read articles like 20 to 30 percent of global trade. Correct me if I'm wrong, Richard or Colin, but I mean, there's a lot of boats out there. So and this military activity going on. So, yeah, I'd love to know, like, what's it like? Yeah. And while we're talking about this, guys, um, both of you, so you're aware, I mean, Michelle's has a lot of maps teed up mm -hmm. uh, and graphs. So as you're talking, if you want to describe something geographically, we can zoom in and do all kinds of things like that. Um, so C Colin, can you just start like, just broad strokes, like what is actually bobbing out there on the waters? Oh, sorry. Uh, is that a specific area that you want to look at? Uh, okay, so South China Seas, um, we're, are we seeing American ships? Are we seeing more Chinese ships? Is it just a, a potpourri of different um, countries' mm -hmm. na navies out there. I mean, I guess for someone who doesn't, who you know, doesn't study the military, mm -hmm. it's hard to wrap my mind around what's actually happening mm -hmm. in the context of these skirmishes, mm -hmm. right? Like these ocean mm -hmm. waters are vast. Mm -hmm. The the South China Sea appear on the map to be pretty small, but it is uh, still a large semi-enclosed sea body. And we are looking at a very complex, what we call pattern of life uh, of, um, you know, maritime activity. So if you talk about uh, not just uh, government vessels, we are looking at a whole, uh, you know, array of civilian vessels ranging from the big tankers, container ships, um, and coastal freighters. And I think more commonly also, uh, we are looking at uh, offshore support vessels that were, you know, supporting the offshore uh, energy activities. And of course, I think most uh, prevalently will be the fishing vessels of various sizes. But there is no, not really, you know, a sort of a uh, of the count uh, figure on what each country tends to have. But let's just focus on a few countries, right? For China, I think uh, in terms of the offshore presence, uh, 
that actually has been pretty more dominant uh, vis-a-vis the Philippines and even vis-a-vis the US. Why I say that? Um, For China, over the uh, one decade or so, it has managed to build two things. One uh, would be the fleet of Coast Guard as well as Navy vessels. Um, And of course, secondly, would be those artificial islands that started to appear after 2014. And hold on one second. Yeah, Michelle's going to pull up the artificial islands or the... the First, I think it'd be good to look at the Chinese naval fleet. We've got an infographic as of 2015 that shows Mm. what kind of ships that are part of the Chinese fleet. Um, And you were just mentioning the Coast Guard there, Colin. Down here, we've got um, the Chinese Coast Guard ships. I'm going to zoom in here. Everybody bear with me. Yeah, and Colin, I I didn't want to interrupt your thought, but please continue your thought while Michelle pulls these visuals up for us. And I know Jared's probably going to drop the link in. Yeah, it's in there now. Yeah, Yeah. for those of uh, you who want to follow along. Uh, Sorry, Colin. So you were saying, yes, about these, this is the largest buildup uh, of the Chinese Navy. And I understand that the Chinese Navy Mm -hmm. is now larger than the United States one? I don't know by what metric. Is that true? It's true. Um, In terms of the number of ships built per year, China's uh, shipbuilding capacity dwarfs uh, what the U.S. has been able to do uh, within one year on the average. Uh, This is a very very, uh, phenomenal build-up by China, not just uh, for the Navy itself, but also for the Coast Guard. We are looking at a phenomenal growth of, you know, the Coast Guard and Navy. And of course, we are even looking at the maritime militia, uh, you know, sort of boasting uh, pretty uh, capable vessels as well. So Colin, this Colin, was the one. I, uh, Colin, I'm so sorry. Can I jump in there? Because we've got an infographic that is directly related mm-hmm. to what you're talking about right now, uh, kind of comparing the U.S. versus uh, China, Chinese mm-hmm. Navy fleets. Um, so I'm just going mm-hmm. to um, bring that graphic in here. So this says over time, um, this is the Chinese naval fleet back here in 2000. And then it shows we're right here, right around 2024. It definitely is bigger than the U.S. Navy fleet and is projected to be way bigger. Um, do you mind talking about why this is happening, this this difference in trajectory between the two navies? Okay, so I will summarize more concisely on that. Now, we are looking at, of course, you know, on the one hand, a PIA Navy that is, you know, uh, rather busy trying to modernize uh, a whole huge fleet of Cold War era vessels, and thereby what we're seeing here is what we call a block replacement of a huge number of ships within a short span of time. Uh, those legacy vessels that belong to the Cold War are progressively being decommissioned and replaced with relatively newer and younger vessels. Whereas on the other hand, for the US, while it has a much higher baseline of more capable vessels, but they dated uh, back earlier, say in the 80s and say in the early 90s, and gradually as they age, uh, they become less available and then they sort of get decommissioned. Now, the one thing that we are seeing here is that the US Navy is not building as quickly as it would to replace the ships that it will want to decommission. So for example, just this week, the um, financial year, or fiscal year 2025 budget request for the US Navy means that you know more than 10 vessels will be decommissioned, but only six ships uh, will be ordered. Uh, for that fi- uh, fiscal year. So as you can see, the replacement isn't catching up with the decommissioning. So in other words, we are seeing here the shrinking of the US Navy. And the, on the other hand, we are looking at the expansion right. of the Chinese Navy. Now, um, the Chinese Navy fleet, as re- represented by the graphic, you, you need to give up some context to it. Mm. One is that the Chinese Navy still actually has a huge fleet of smaller vessels. Smaller vessels like corvettes and patrol craft and fast attack craft, usually they are more useful in the littorals or the coastal waters. Whereas for the US Navy, um, the bulk of its fleet uh, are actually blue water capable vessels. But the only problem here is that for the Chinese Navy, Mm. um, they have the luxury of focusing on regional hotspots that were close to shore. But the U.S. Navy is a global navy that has a wide-ranging responsibility, so they can't focus like the Chinese Navy on one single region. So the trend that you are presenting here 
uh, is something that we are going to see as a structural uh, problem going forward. That That is fascinating. And while we continue this conversation, Michelle, why don't you just pull up the man-made islands yep. visuals? And we can talk over that on, about other stuff yeah, because, Colin, I know just, you were getting to it. And well, it, just from the chat, just yeah. picking up on the Navy, um, Bad Mats 89, China's Navy is larger but it's made in China. That's the point um, there that, that Colin was making. Um, and also, um, you know, quite a few uh, comments just about um, the strength of the uh, Chinese Navy coming in. Um, and uh, Ed Rojas, the days of grand naval battles are over, um, he says. Um, obviously, um, I, well... Maybe that's controversial, actually, but I guess he's talking about the fact that um, the Chinese, it's so much bigger at the moment than, um, than the American Navy anyway, particularly in that part of the world. But quite a few comments, a lot of interest, can I say, in the Navy and the ships and um, the actual, you know, what they are. So if we know anything more about that... Um, that would be great to, <laughs> to yeah, get yeah, any I mean, more info because there's interest Richard, in it. Um, let's bring in Richard because um, you've been you've been uh, listening to all this. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about w what's the thinking behind uh, the Chinese building these man-made islands? Um, you know, there are these amazing before and after photos. Uh, is this again trying to plant their flag uh, on the soil and sort of claim it? Uh, if you look at these. They're uh, just building out these military assets. Is it strategic or is it just symbolic? What's going on here? Well, I, I think it's all of the above. There's 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 definitely a symbolic value to this. Uh, I mean, uh, and there's the legal aspect to it, or at least that's that's the hope of China, because you know, as far as international law is concerned, effective and continuous exercise of jurisdiction is one way of proving that we have sovereignty over certain territory, except, of course, China is never going to be open to taking these cases to international court. But that's that also gives them a kind of a psychological and symbolic like edge. changing but the facts on the ground, speaking, essentially, sure, right? Like changing the facts changing on the ground. Practical, yeah. And we see this all around the world, right, in disputed territories. The party that has the upper hand in terms of changing facts on the ground over time creates a psycho some sort of psychological reality, a political reality for that matter. Now, militarily, I remember very well back in 2013 when China went on this kind of uh, geoengineering on steroids, there were many dismissive commentaries came coming out of the United States. Um, many people in the U.S. Navy and Pentagon were saying, ah, we can just bomb that thing in a few hours, they'll be gone. But I think more and more studies throughout the years, I'm sure Colin has his own uh, take on this, have shown that it could actually give China some significant amount of military prowess, especially when dealing with the smaller powers in the region, but perhaps also vis-a-vis -vis America. And more importantly, remember, China has not reached the final phase of its strategy in the South China Sea. So I think it's now perhaps only in phase three. So first phase was reclamation. Second phase was militarizing those fake islands. Third is what I call militiaization, meaning using militia forces, fake, uh, you know, fishermen to create intimidation tactics, but short of the threshold of triggering war or the Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty. But we know that the final phase would really be China declaring an air defense identification zone, meaning completely dominating the skies in the area as a way to dominate the seas in the area. And that means it will have to have a network of air bases uh, and all sorts of defense capabilities in the area. So it has an end goal. But And, and that reminds me, this, I mean, you talk about the air defense identification yeah. zone. That's what it's doing uh, to Taiwan, right? That's where we're seeing that the, the jets flying in the ADIZ uh, do you guys call it ADIZ or ADIZ? I don't know. But um, and it, so you're yes, saying that yes. they're kind of taking that strategy that they have with Taiwan and sort of expanding it to the South China Seas or the West Philippine Sea, depending, right? Yeah, Melissa, fantastic point. Actually, the Taiwan angle is very important. I think many strategists would say that one way of China also dominating Taiwan and winning over Taiwan is to secure the rear of Taiwan, and the rear of Taiwan will be the South China Sea, and to a certain degree, the Philippines, something that we can discuss later on. So you really cannot separate this thing. I mean, we, we tend to separate East China Sea, Taiwan Straits, South China Sea, but China today treats all of these bodies of waters as an integrated theater of operation. So all of the things that they're doing on the ground is part of that strategy. Now, as far as the Philippines is concerned, the latest tensions, I would say there are essentially three areas. Mm -hmm. One is in the Scarborough Shoal. Perhaps you can pull it up in the map. It's yep. just over 100 nautical miles of the Philippines' uh, Luzon um, uh, island, the northern island when the capital Manila is. 
We see a lot of tensions there. In fact, the 20, in 2012, we saw a months-long naval standoff between the Philippines and China there. And that was really the wake-up call for the Philippines because for almost a century, the Philippines essentially outsourced its external security needs to the United States of America. It was a very peculiar, and I would say as a Filipino, quite an embarrassing situation for quite some time. But we were shaken out of that stupor. And since 2012, we have been engaging in a modernization of our armed forces. Now, China is just so big that they make all of us look small. But I think the Philippines has a good chance of becoming a well, credible middle power, modern power later this decade. But the two other areas are, of course, in the Spratly group of islands, mm -hmm. particularly around, around Tito Island. And the other one where we see a lot of really violent, potentially explosive tensions is the second Thomas Shoal, yeah. which you mentioned a while ago. We have we have a grounded ship there since 1998. We have a de facto marine detachment there. And we that's the Sierra Madre, right? There, I but think the we Chinese have... are preventing it. Yeah, yes. we, we have we this have pictures of it, and and while we're pulling those pictures up, I, I this is exactly the kind of uh, this is the question I want to ask. We've been looking at the Chinese, the strength of the Chinese Navy. We've talked a little bit about the the assumed strength of the Americans. What is the strength of the Philippine Navy? I mean, you're talking about um, the Philippines needing to ex exert, you know, and and its its sovereignty over the waters that it believes uh, it, it it controls. Um, and then yet we have these images of the Sierra Madre. It, doesn't look great. Um, let's pull it, <laughs> it up. Um, it's, yeah. Is it Michelle or Dustin that has this? Uh, um, these photos? I've got this on my laptop. I'm okay. going to try and make it bigger here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is what we've got. Um, this is you can see. It's just really a, a rust bucket, a rusted Hulk. I mean, I've read yeah. accounts of people who have reported from it's there. A, yeah, it's a tetanus-friendly site, I would say. It's a tetanus-friendly site. It's, it's, it's a horrible site uh, as far as uh, the Philippines' position is. But this reflects the horrible strategic decisions made by former Filipino presidents, right? Mm. None of them, you know, actually the last Filipino president who was forward looking and did something on the ground. Remember, 1977, 78, the Philippines already had a modern airstrip in that area. That was under Ferdinand Marcos Sr. I'm no fan of dictators, but if there's one thing that that guy got right, was on foreign policy. That's mm. why Kissinger and Nixon were worried that they could get dragged into a war, hence your question on the mutual defense treaty. The reason why America was ambiguous was because the Philippines was the mini bully. Back then, we had the best armed forces or among the best in Southeast Asia. But for 30 years, the Philippines was an economic doldrum, strategic neglect, but we're coming back. So the Philippines obviously is not 10 out of 10, and China makes all of us look pathetic in certain ways. Mm. But we're going from, let's say, one or two towards five, six, or seven out of 10 in the coming years or so. So I think the Philippines have come very far, especially if you look at the Philippine Coast Guard. I'm sure Colin has to say something about this, but I think Philippine Coast Guard right now is among the best in the Southeast Asian region. And some of the new um, vessels they have, they're pretty fancy. I've been in many, many modern vessels all around the world. Colin knows that. But the ones I'm seeing in the Philippines right now are very encouraging. Thanks to, not because they're my host right now, but also thanks to Japan. Uh, mm. uh, former President Shinzo Abe, among others, made sure countries like the Philippines on the front line will get that capacity building help. So the Philippines is nowhere close uh, to, to, to China, but it's getting closer to becoming at least a David versus I, I, the Goliath of China if the current trends continue. And let me just pick up on that because Jetpack um, Rorsha has said a modernization in the Navy which is paid for and supplied by dot, 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 the US. Is that correct? No, not at all. Actually, I completely agree with one of the comments earlier. Like, we have been with the Americans shoulder to shoulder. How many world wars? By the way, First World War, Second World War, Cold War, Vietnam War, Korean War. So, I mean, j just look at the amount of aid America is giving to countries, uh, Ukraine. Of course, I understand it's a war situation. Or look at some countries in the Middle East, uh, countries that are even not even U.S. treaty allies, like, like Jordan or Egypt. You know, Israel is a totally different level, or Pakistan. These are countries that have been getting billions of dollars in aid. They're getting... Advanced weapon systems, F-16s, Abrams tanks. The Philippines, until quite recently, were getting Vietnam-era kind of weapon systems from the Americans. So as I said, it was really under Trump and Biden that things have begun to change. But the Philippines is not just going to rely on the Americans anymore. We're reaching out to the Americans. As, in, as we speak, President Marcos Jr. is there in Germany talking to Chancellor Scholz or was talking to Chancellor Scholz. Right. We're looking at France for potential acquisition of submarine. So we're finally looking at the whole network of partners and allies because we know we cannot just rely on the Americans.
and are any more questions? Maybe yeah, I we can just, throw uh, one to uh, call. Uh, well, just let me pick up on one thing um, that uh, has come up in the chat by somebody called um, uh, Randy Rowdy, um, who seems to um, be making a suggestion that the uh, chat um, is being done by AI. And I can tell you it 100% is not. I am looking at it, and Jared across from me is looking at it, and together we are trying to read all your comments. So please understand we are not using AI. I'm sure it would be a lot easier if we were, but we're not. We're Hen hence wearing glasses. Chat. <laughs> exactly. We're, yeah, we're so real that was people. important, um, <laughs> just to point that out. Um, so, yes, we do make, make mistakes and read things incorrectly, but we are um, trying to do it the best we can. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that point. And, um, do we have any questions for a Colin, maybe? Um, for Colin, we've got quite a few um, coming up about uh, China and the US, but I think we probably don't want to get onto that yet. But I have a question that I would like to ask, which is about, um, you're talking about Coast Guards. Um, these fishermen that we seem to be seeing on, on both sides, particularly on the Chinese side, are they fishermen that we're seeing or are they militia people in disguise because um, I seem to be reading two different accounts on that. Yeah, they seem to be very adventurous fishermen. Yes. <laughs> Colin, can, mm. you, can you help mm. us on that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the Chinese maritime militia is essentially um, you know, what we call uh, um, a, a reservist force for the most part. Uh, they have uh, in Hainan a uh, force that is designed as a core force uh, that is equipped with specialized vessels. Um, there are some of these specialized vessels uh, that were actually, you know, very active in the South China Sea. Now, give you the context. The average age of uh, maritime militia personnel is uh, aging. So younger uh, maritime militia men are not as motivated as a more senior um, counterparts or their predecessors. And usually, you know, what happened was that during the time when there was a fishing ban, by right, the maritime militia uh, personnel will undergo some refresher training. But in the recent years, the trend had been that um, these maritime militia men, they would prefer to find jobs on land uh, during those times when there was no fishing. And some, uh, many of them may not necessarily undergo the training. So recognizing that uh, the Chinese uh, thereby also created a specialized force uh, within Hainan especially. But for the most part, uh, it's not right to say that you know, all of them are maritime militia vessels. It's also uh, not right to say that none of them are maritime militia vessels. The issue here is that they don't wear uniforms. They mm. do wear uniforms uh, mm. during their training and during parades. But on any normal day, they are out there fishing. Uh, even in daytime, while they are operating as fishermen, they have the obligation to take part in activities when called upon by the Navy or by or by the Coast Guard. Um, and of course, they have to report any uh, a, a sort of a anomalous activities that they encounter that will require their authorities' attention. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, those fishermen, whether you are looking at them, you know, being put there for specialized or uh, specific maritime mission duty or just fishing duties, that they essentially play a part uh, mm. in asserting China's sovereignty. Yeah. So fishermen soldiers but are they paid kind of. are, are they paid extra for doing those um those special i mean i huh. you, i suppose you can't call them missions but you know mm. well maybe you can call them missions but are they paid extra mm. by the by the chinese to do that mm. okay so i will quickly jump on that um for sure depending on the missions that they are assigned to they may get additional allowances mm -hmm. on top of that the more common uh, practice is that they get pretty heavy uh, state subsidies for things like fuel, uh, ship maintenance and repairs. That cover a lot of the costs, in fact. And in fact, you know, suffice to say, put it bluntly, is that um, even if there's no fish out there, mm. the government sees it fit to actually pay them and, and foot the bills to send them out there because they are essentially floating pieces of sovereignty. So therefore, you know, uh, we don't uh, underestimate the fact that even if there are no fish out in the South China Sea, um, they still play an important role, and it's a political one. That's fascinating. And um, before we go any further, though, Jared, yes. what's been cooking online? Well, just in terms of the fishermen, uh, Harry Namkung says some are fishermen, some are militia. Um, <laughs> interesting comment. Uh, we are being accused of 
fear-mongering and slander yes. towards ah. uh, China. So I think there's a lot of different heated opinions on exactly what we're talking about. But um, that was one opinion. Someone else has written here, China is acting like a bully. Um, of course, when we're talking about China in this context, it's, it's easy to um, sort of make a link to Russia, which is what this person's done, much similar to Russia, but less aggressive, but they are completely dependent on Western consumers, which buy their goods. We can stop buying, according to FJE. Uh, one comment that I, I kind of wanted to point out, some people are talking every so often about The Hague, mm. and that is because uh, an international tribunal ruled in 2016 uh, it dismissing Beijing's claim. Right, Michelle had mentioned of that earlier. The but, South China Sea, yeah. exactly what you were talking about. Of course, that seems to have had little impact on what China's been doing, but some people pointing out that the Philippines maybe themselves uh, failed to capitalise on that ruling. They mm. could have been more assertive right. at the time, but they weren't, and maybe they've missed that opportunity. Some people making mm. that. I mean, China's that been making hay <laughs> yeah. in a and, sense and in terms of the build up that we've seen. We've got some pictures of the before and after if we want to get to that at some point, but go ahead. And just quickly, just picking up on, um, on the fishermen again, um, Amber Drake reporting to duty when called is 100% a militia reserve force. So. Um, this whole thing about that, you know, it's it's just yeah. a bit of an allowance. Obviously, Amber Drake does not believe that. Well, so, I mean, I'm, I'm the fear mongering. Let's let's get into that. <laughs> I mean, for those of you still uh, just joining, uh, we've been talking about uh, the question: China and the Philippines, Asia's hot uh, next hot war, and and uh, someone accusing uh, the conversation of being too much fear mongering uh, when it comes to China. Mm -hmm. I want to present that question uh, to both of our guests, Richard and uh, Colin. Uh, you know, we've spent time looking at the <laughs> what's actually happening on the water. Um, let's pull back now. Why is this fear mongering? Why is China interested in this region? Is it ideological? Is it nationalistic? Uh, what's going on here? Uh, maybe we should start with um, Richard, since Colin was uh, speaking earlier. Well, I mean, that, I, I'm sure Colin also has a lot of quote unquote followers slash trolls there who are happy to always uh, bash whatever we say here. But this is precisely what I've been saying this gaslighting that they're doing to countries. I mean, all we're doing is just calling out soft excesses, sir. You know, you know the Philippines wants to have a good relationship with China. We have an interest in having a good relationship with China. We don't want to have war with China. But China cannot expect us not to say anything when they're essentially slapping us around, intimidating us. Mm -hmm. Several Filipino naval personnel, including a vice admiral, commander in the Philippine West Command near the South China Sea disputed areas, were injured during one of these operations. So to say the Philippines is the fear monger is quite rich from some of the people who are clearly sympathetic to the other side. I mean, China always does it. It escalates the situations, it tries to impose its will, it bullies its way around, and if someone says something, they'll say, oh, you're provoking, oh, you're trying to, to make things, you're making drama, right? You're a drama queen, right? They always do that, it's classic strategic uh, gaslighting. Having said that, though, it is important that we don't forget the value of diplomacy. So I think I appreciate President Marcos Jr.'s tone, because as much as President Marcos Jr. points out the dangers and threats on the ground, if you look at his tone, he always tries to extend an olive branch to China. He, he went to China last year. He met President Xi Jinping on the sidelines of APEC last November. He is open to have negotiations with them. But the red lines of the Philippines as a sovereign nation should be respected. If China wants to be seen as a peaceful rising power, it has to respect some of the basic sovereign rights of neighboring countries. So th that is why, I mean, if this is fear mongering, then what do we call people just water cannoning other countries' navy and injuring people right and left? And that's what, that's what, war mongering? Well, um, Devos says in the chat, this isn't fear mongering. Um, this is talking about something that could lead to a world war situation. Yeah, I mean, uh, Colin, can you? Yes, it, mm. I would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, is is this? How would you respond to the person who is saying that this is fear mongering? And what is the ideological drive of China? If you can get into the psychology of Beijing a little bit for us. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so I will I will first tackle the second question. I think that is probably something that uh, interests uh, many of our audience here. 
there is no one single reason why China wants the spread list or, you know, more broadly, those uh, contested South China Sea archipelagos. Uh, there are various reasons for that, and all of them, uh, I believe, are equally important. Uh, one has to do with uh, emotion, right? That um, the South China Sea was variously referred to in China as a historical blue territory. The use of the word blue territory is a very strong one because if you go by international law, you don't claim waters as territory beyond your 12 nautical miles territorial sea. Uh, as simple as that. So that, that is one. Of course, there is a clear economic uh, stake in the South China Sea. Uh, we talk about the fishery, we talk about the hydrocarbon resources. And for China these days, they're talking about you know, some form of methane uh, deposit that is considered what they call a next generation energy source. Um, we're talking about the strategic value and you bring in Taiwan. And I, I fully agree with what Richard has said earlier that both the South China Sea and Taiwan are seen as a contiguous whole. Um, the South China Sea essentially is the southern flank of any future potential conflict over Taiwan. So therefore, it's important. And the fourth one is that if you look at the you know, open source uh, intelligence uh, material, it's very clear that the South China Sea has become a key arena for China's sea-based nuclear deterrent. Um, most of its nuclear submarines, or in fact, one would say all of its nuclear uh, ballistic missile submarines are all based in Hainan. Um, and the South China Sea is believed to be what they call uh, a safe sanctuary for those um, you know, ballistic missile submarines from which they could launch their missiles uh, and be safe from any uh, potential action from the enemy. So. These, there are a whole slew of these reasons to underpin why the South China Sea is so important to China. But one thing to note is that the current uh, ruling Communist Party has to go on with the current narrative because doing otherwise is going to be detrimental to its political legitimacy. One will argue that you know over the time, national education in China has been very successful, but the CCP also finds itself a victim of its own success because mm. basically mm. you are talking about a young generation of Chinese citizens who are born and raised in an era where they saw no hardship. Uh, essentially, they are born in an era where China is strong and they, and they expect China to be strong. They expect the ruling party to fight back against any perceived grievances, uh, say on the South China Sea, uh, without hesitation. Um, so therefore, in a way, it is public diplomacy also for CCP. Now, to address the second question, and of course, going back to the first question, I, I really wanted to weigh in on what uh, Richard has said about whether we are fear-mongering. Look, um, just to share with you, I've been looking at the South China Sea as part of my research on Southeast Asia, uh, naval affairs and maritime security for the past 10 years at least. And I saw the trends, I documented the incidents, and I think it's very clear that we are seeing here a very dangerous situation. Now, you remember, you know, back in 2020, when all the Southeast Asian countries are busy trying to cope with a new menace, and that is COVID-19, right. China wasn't letting up. China was essentially making use of the distraction of COVID-19 to basically poke the eye of the various Southeast Asian parties in the South China Sea. Um, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, and then, you know, the following year, in 2021, we saw the Philippines become the next victim. Uh, essentially, China doesn't really care. Now, my, my advice to those who want to argue that we are fear-mongering is first go and do your research, right? Don't <laughs> just read certain newspaper. Don't just read certain social media do your research, you know, and trust the scholars who are doing impartial research. And we present, you know, hard data just to show you. For example, people who say that, oh, this thing about maritime militia doesn't exist. Let me share with you. If you have access to the Chinese database, uh, which is an academic database, for example, National Knowledge uh, Infrastructure or CNKI or even Wang Fang, you will have all the ton of, you know, Chinese literature on the maritime militia. And let me share with you, there is one Chinese journal called the Journal of the Militia, okay? Mm. And all those papers on maritime militia are all written by their officers, okay? And political commissars, high-ranking officers, and even senior scholars. Tell me whether they exist or not, okay? They exist, 
and it's very clear what they are writing about, you know, with regard to what they want to do, what they need to do. And of course, there is a whole slew of journals on the China Coast Guard. I mean, uh, but Carl, Carl, you, you, you're recommending, yeah, uh, no, you're recommending <laughs> articles uh, that, from China, but this is a perfect opportunity for yeah. you and Richard to showcase and share to mm -hmm. viewers articles and journal pieces that both of you guys have put out. So I just want to throw that out there. You're far too humble, Colin. Tell, <laughs> tell us what you've written and in, in what media so that people who are online right now can Google search it and, and, and read some of the things that you've been writing recently. Um, uh, oh, you, maybe you want to ask Richard to go first? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, finish your thought. I mean, you're in such a role. Why, why don't you tell us like two articles or journal articles from, from, from you that we Go should ahead, all buddy. be, yeah. And then Richard, you get ready with your, your uh, plug as well. Okay. Uh, I, I roughly remember the year that I wrote some of those articles were around 2017, 2018, and they were published with uh, the National Interest. Mm. Um, you will, can Google my name and the National Interest, and you'll find articles that I wrote on the Maritime Militia and the China Coast Guard, for example. Um, there is this uh, piece that I wrote on the um, Chinese uh, Maritime Militia that was published with the Heritage Foundation just a few years back as well. So uh, you can look at them, uh, I recommend. But obviously, you know, if you read Chinese and you have access to databases, that's where you find a whole gem of knowledge regarding you know, what the Chinese maritime militia is doing and what they're thinking about in the future, uh, what the China Coast Guard is doing, what, what challenges they face and what are the things they want to do, all written by Chinese scholars and practitioners, okay? And you, you did say that if anyone says you are fear mongering, hey, look, you know, are you trying to say that, you know, the Chinese themselves are fear mongering themselves, mm. okay? Yeah, so I just want to end that. Yeah. Yes, they're actually, they're, this is what they're saying uh, that they're going to do and their intentions. So Richard, over to you. Uh, what should we be looking up? Uh, articles, a podcast, uh, you do so many different things. Well, I mean, I don't know, probably what, a thousand articles I've written on South <laughs> China Asia, but these are popular articles and a dozen probably academic articles. But I just have two books which focus on the South China Sea, either directly or or at least uh, a chapter or two where I focus on that one is the Asia's New Battlefield. I wrote it back in 2015 and the Indo-Pacific, uh, more a recent book. But I have another book um, on China's relations with Southeast Asian countries with South China Sea obviously also prominent there, hopefully coming out later this year with Melbourne University Press. But if you don't want to read my stuff, just follow me online and you'll get the more I, I don't know, juicy, sexy version of my academic works. So, Because I, I wear many hats, so it depends which version of mine do you want to see. Yeah. The various shades of the various the shades of yeah, Richard. Yeah. Richard yeah. I think I'm not going to be invited anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Me, it's 12 p.m. I, it's, it's almost midnight here in Japan, so I'm not at my shark. I'm sorry. Um, no, no. I mean, but but guys, uh, Richard and Colin, st stay with us. Uh, but I want to at this time, since we threw up that poll at the very beginning of this uh, discussion, we had thrown up a poll. You might have missed it if you were, uh, but it's actually online all the time. Uh, yeah. Jared, I think you have been following that can you just tell us what the results have been and what you're what's yeah, going on over there exactly so the poll was asking what do you think is more likely a chinese conflict with the philippines or a chinese conflict with taiwan uh, at the moment we have a bit over a thousand votes um, 32% of people, uh, I'll start with the least actually, so 28% uh, of people say there'll be no conflict, 32% of people believe that there'll be conflict with the Philippines and coming out on, uh, on top is a conflict with Taiwan on 40%. But there's a but to this, isn't there? Because although there's one over a thousand votes so far, there was another poll, wasn't there? Before that's right. I before mean, we, the stream we had technical began. glitch. We had, we had some technical uh, issues, so we had a poll that had started before the stream, but quite it a lot got, of people uh, voted. Yeah, so we we probably had roughly double uh, these amount of votes that uh, half of them got deleted by accident. These things by happen, accident. but. Uh, I think it was roughly the same similar results. figures. So. Okay, okay, the internet has spoken. Yes. Yeah. And let me just pick up on a couple of, um, of, of more comments that we've had, just talking about the situation with China and what's it trying to do. Um, we have got here um, Pomni, China can't just let go of claims because they need that legitimacy of a strong China. Um, and that's and, what Colin just said. And that's what yeah. Colin was saying, exactly. Um, we've got Bad Mats 89, no one wins in war. 
Um, we've got Carlo Sto Domingo. China needs to focus on its own issues instead of bullying Asian neighbours. Um, and so it goes on. Quite a lot more on those. So. A lot of people weighing in on a question. China and the Philippines, Asia's next hot war. Uh, maybe this is a good time to go around and just, uh, if everyone has takeaways or, or, or thoughts. And then we also want uh, Richard and Colin's sort of takeaways over the last hour as well. Um, but uh, Alex? Um... Um, well, I think that, the, that what I was had never seen before was um, the rust bucket of that um, Filipino naval ship that was originally American called the, the Sierra Mandra. Mandra. Maybe we can show it one last and time. I just oh, find it extraordinary yeah, um... That, um, that the Philippines is sort of using that to try to basically to bag to bag a, a sandbank, to bag a piece of mm. land or land something in the sea. And I just find that whole concept mind blowing. That plus these fishermen stroke militia. Yep. It's just a, a incredible what's actually going on if you don't know and go. you're not interested. Michelle's pulled it up. There it is. I just find that amazing <laughs> that it's still floating. Let's keep that actually. up while uh, we go to Michelle. Uh, sure. I, I have to go back to the comments and something that Colin said for my takeaway. Uh, he said there, do your research. Mm. And uh, that goes back to a comment um, that North 4545 said, um, basically referencing that he find he found it amusing women talking about war. Well, as we all know, <laughs> war has really affected the lives of all genders uh, here in Europe mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about um, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. And so, you know, we're talking about potential scenarios here, but everybody really needs to be aware and do their research of what's happening so we can be aware of these events that are shaping are very interesting times. Yeah, yeah. I think that that rust bucket ship uh, was my takeaway as well. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to copy you, Alex, and, and also just touch on Michelle. We had just, we just had the comment: uh, no one wins in war, and that absolutely. really is absolutely the case. That's probably my takeaway. And for me, um, Richard, I have to say, I really love that term, strategic gaslighting. So, you know, I think I'll try to use it at some point um, <laughs> it, my, myself. Um, but uh, over to you guys, sort of like uh, uh, takeaways you guys have had from either uh, people's comments that we've shared uh, and, and this conversation. I know that you spend a lot of time thinking about this, but, uh, you know, uh, one big top line or something, uh, Colin, uh, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, okay, just uh, one uh, very quick talk, uh, especially with respect to the whole issue of fear mongering and whatnot. I think, yeah, I agree that, you know, no one wins if there's a war. However, everyone wins if everyone obeys international law. I think what's more important here is things will get better if China obeys international law. Mm -hmm. I think simple as that. Thank you. Thank you. Richard. Well, thank you for, for mentioning that. I mean, you're free to uh, check my copyright on that term. But thank you. Trademark that no, no, term, let right? Me first of all, let me first of all, yeah, yeah, let me first strongman my government. I mean, after all, I've been criticizing the Philippines for quite some time and mm -hmm. uh, in, in this show alone. Uh, but actually, that may be rusty and ugly on the outside, but they may have better internet inside than my internet over the past hour or so. So <laughs> there have been efforts by the Philippine government to fortify uh, that that feature. So we may be seeing a better version of that uh, inside and out uh, in the coming uh, years or so. So do not judge a, a marine detachment by its rusty, tetanus-friendly uh, uh, <laughs> exterior. But, but let me just end on this point. Um, uh, what's interesting is, we didn't mention this a while ago, but China's 9-line, 10-line, whatever you call it, comes from Taiwan or to be more specific about it, Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang. Oh, you're throwing in a curveball. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We can that. that. Republic and, of and, China. And, 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 and let's, be <laughs> let's be also clear about this. I mean, I love them back in time. I'm just saying. Um, so, so, so China's not even original about that. But what's interesting is that they never clarified the exact coordinates of that 9-line or 10-line. Mm -hmm. As bad as that is, that also means China wants to negotiate that down the point. Because if they mm -hmm. were to clarify the exact coordinates, they would have locked in, in themselves, especially with all the popular nationalism and patriotic education that Colin uh, uh, correctly pointed out. Last point, this mm -hmm. issue with the Philippines, even if it doesn't lead to war, it says a lot about China as a rising superpower. China is presenting itself as a peacemaker in the Middle East, a peacemaker, I don't know, in Ukraine, all around the world. But if it's not 
a peacemaker or a source of peace in his own backyard, in his own supposed backyard, in, and in East Asia and South China Sea, then perhaps that should be a wake-up call for the rest of the world, including you guys in Europe. Thank, Thank you. Um, just, uh, Alex, just, yeah. just quickly, mm. um, Charles M in the chat talking again about that, that rust bucket of a ship. Um, the Sierra Madre. The Sierra Madre. Um, it's no longer a ship. It's part of a coral, um, he says. And also just picking up mm. on what Colin had, uh, had said about, the, about that law, the 2016 law, um, Biz, Biz Kings says, no matter how strong China's military, a law is a law. Philippines is, is legal. China is squatting in this territory. So that is what that comment has just come through, yeah. Well, Richard Haydarian, Colin Co, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's late over there, so uh, should uh, bid you adieu and have a sweet dreams, no nightmares of <laughs> South China Sea conflicts. We are really grateful for this. Thank you. Pleasure, guys, always. And great to uh, join Colin again. Hopefully, you can have both of us in the future. Uh, yeah. I'll behave myself better if, if it's a better hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Good to share the same panel as you. Yeah. Uh, see you, Richard. Uh, see you, guys. See you, guys. Well, it's been a Thanks. great chat. I've learned so much. Um, and frankly, as someone who used to be based in China and Asia for over a decade, I thought I knew a lot. But uh, I learned so much today. Um, right. Thanks to everyone who took part. Um, thank you to those of us, uh, to, to those <laughs> to of us, every, well, to, to all of us around the table. Also, <laughs> I want to thank Michelle, Alex, Jared. Thank you, Dustin, in the control room. Thanks to everyone online. Absolutely love it. Yeah, absolutely. Massively thank you. It's been a really, really active chat. Really grateful for that. Um, next week, you can check out in our community tab what we will be discussing on our YouTube platform about 24 hours before. So that'll be next Tuesday to find out what we're talking about on Wednesday. And then please engage again. It is so great to have this kind of chat going on. We're really grateful. We'll see you next week. Thank you.